Welcome back to the Building Equity Podcast. I'm James Schlimmer. And I'm John Bowens. And we are here, episode nine, where we have the uneducated economist explains the truth about the 2023 housing market crash or collapse. But John Bowens, before we get into that, today's show is brought to you by IRA Title Pro. And I don't know if you know a lot of self-directed IRA investors that are buying and selling real estate with their IRA. They need to know about IRA Title Pro. And I urge that they go to iratitlepro.com, head over to the site, take a look at the resources tab as it comes down. We've got so many amazing tools for real estate investors to use at every step of their journey before they buy, sell, or lend. Visit IRA Title Pro, but let's get back into it. We've got an amazing show today, John. This gentleman, Simon, the uneducated economist, I had a chance to see him live in Miami uh, midsummer. And he has an unbelievable gift of taking an incredibly complex subject like the economy, right? Uh, macro economy, and even down to the micro level, and be able to translate it into kind of layman's terms. So you can walk away understanding, hey, I think I understand what he means here. And in addition to that, why I wanted him on the Building Equity Podcast for our real estate investors is the guy is an expert in lumber, right? I'm talking about every facet of the lumber industry. So when the cost of lumber shoots up to $1,800 or $1,700, and all of a sudden, when you go to build a house and it's unbelievably priced, right? Or your builder does a change order and now you have to spend more money. This guy knows exactly why that's the case. And I wanted him to get on the show here and talk a little bit about lumber, talk about the economy, and uh, hopefully our viewers walk away with a, uh, a new tool in their toolbox, the uneducated economist. As always, I'm, I'm really excited for it. And on behalf of myself as an investor, as well as all the folks that are part of my tribe, that I am trying to educate and inform and help them be successful as real estate investors. Many folks are coming to me right now asking the question, I'm sitting on dry powder and I'm looking for where should I be considering or thinking about deploying that capital. In fact, James, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but over the last three to four months, there has been a record high number of folks with self-directed IRAs who have sold properties. So these are folks that bought properties from, call it 2009 to 2015. Yep. They have now harvested those profits, those gains, which have flowed back into their self-directed retirement plans, tax deferred and or tax free. And now they're looking at what are my options for deploying that capital? And of course, in a high inflationary environment, we have to consider the erosion effect of our principal. And so I'm excited to jump in here with Simon to talk about what should we be considering as investors that are looking to deploy our capital in a meaningful way. I, I couldn't be more excited about what you just said too, because I, I see it, it's clear to me, right? You got these investors are gonna sell, they're gonna, they're gonna take their win because they bought at a low, they're selling at a relative high, and then they're gonna wait. And what are they waiting for? And I think they're waiting for you know, this market to correct. And then they're going to be moving in in the next 18 months, and we're going to start to see a lot more opportunities for these real estate investors. So I tell you what, without further ado, why don't we bring Simon to the show and uh, let our viewers get a chance to learn from the uneducated economist. Let's jump in. John Bowens and I, we talked about when we wanted to put this show together, that we want to bring some of the most knowledgeable folks, whether the economists whether they're uh, real estate appraisers, whether they're lawyers, tax professionals, we don't care who they are in the country, we're gonna find them. We're gonna scour the country, and I did that. So this past June, I was in Miami for the Rebel Capitalist Live uh, Investor Conference, and it was awesome. I learned a lot. I told you last night, John, I sat there for the first session the whole day. I had no idea what was going on. Like literally, it seemed like it was a foreign language to me, right? And one gentleman came up on the, uh, the stage. And the keynote speaker said, if you haven't heard of the uneducated economist, you guys need to look him up. And immediately I take out my phone, I go to the YouTube, I'm like, uneducated economist. And there you see Simon. Simon comes up on the stage, he starts talking, and I'm like, oh my God, there's a, like a regular person talking to me about macro level economics, whether it's inflation, whether it's the price of lumber, whether it's real estate, whether it's commodities or bonds, it could be anything. 
And it's like a conversation like you and I would have. So after he finished, I ran outside, I got his card. I was like, we need to get him on because I'm sure the investors that are listening to the Building Equity podcast and watching would love to be able to hear from Simon. So without further ado, let's talk about the uneducated economist is here with us live right here. You can see him on the screen. Now, just so you guys know, it's three hours earlier for him. It's still the morning. And here he is on his set. Simon, thank you so much for joining John and I here on the Building Equity Podcast. Hey, thank you for inviting me on. I'm excited to be here this morning. You know, let me dive right in because uh, I looked at some of your bio on your YouTube page and I just want our audience to get a little feel for you. And w when I see that you talked about, I think it was maybe your last couple shows ago, and as we record this, it is uh, mid-October, but I heard you say that you like barely graduated high school hated reading, right? Um, just lost your job during the financial crisis. And um, the book that was given to you was The Creature from Jekyll Hyde. And that kind of started what you've been able to build. So can you talk a little bit about where you're at today, how you got started? And ultimately, Simon, what do you want the viewers who come to your YouTube channel to walk away with? Yeah, well, um... So we started the channel in November of uh, 2017. And um, at that point, I was really immersed into the macroeconomic study, um, like literally would spend three, four, maybe even five, six hours a day looking up articles, uh, listening to videos, listening to lectures, just trying to you know take in as much macroeconomic information as I could. And... Um, I remember there was a, a girl that I was working with. Her name was Brittany. And Brittany came up to me one day because I was babbling on about like paper tantrum or something. And she comes up to me and she puts her fist on my desk and she looks at me and she's real tall, like farm girl, like rides horses kind of girl. And uh, she looks at me dead in the eye and she says, listen, bro, you need to start a YouTube channel or a blog or something because nobody around here understands anything you're talking about and you are driving us crazy. <laughs> and so, right. And so I was like, Oh, right. Okay. So I grabbed my phone. I went down to my car. I fired it up, did the introductory video to the uneducated economist, went back into work, used the works Wi-Fi to load, upload the video. And the uneducated economist was born after that. I just kept uploading videos after that. So before that, it was a it was a bad time for me. I was uh, I wasn't doing well. I barely, you know, really heavily in debt. Um, I was drinking a lot. Had a foreclosure, you know, going on. It was just a really bad time for me. Um, you know, prior to two thousand eight, it was going great. You know, I had a good construction job. I was making a lot of money. Um, I was in my early thirties. My wife came to me and she was just like, Hey, I'm pregnant. We need to get, you know, a better place to live. So, you know, what do you do? You buy a house, right? So this was like in April of 2007. And it was like <clears throat> almost immediately like went into, you know, for or not foreclosure, but went into the housing market crisis. And then I held on as long as I could, but just really couldn't, couldn't keep up. Um, it was that event failing and losing the house and losing my job and the great financial crisis that really like got me questioning what the hell is going on here. Like I didn't, you know, I was just skating through life before I didn't really care. And, uh, so I'm trying to figure things out and I go to my buddy, you know, and I'm talking to him about, you know, some stuff and he goes, Hey, I got a book for you. And I'm like, man, I don't read. Like I, I haven't really read books since high school. In fact, even in high school, I didn't read books because, you know, I just wasn't into it. And, you know, got not failing grades, but barely graduated. I mean, it was just like I was cut it by the skin of my teeth. And he says, well, I'm going to give you this book anyway. And uh, I think if you dive into it, you're going to find out that you like it. So anyway, he brings this book to me and it's like, I kid you not, this book is like super thick. It's like two inches thick. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, bro, I am not going to get through this book, you know? And he was like, well, just dive into it. And I think you might like it. Well, this book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, written by G. Edward Griffin, this book is really probably the most instrumental book that one could read about opening their eyes to the Federal Reserve and the devious things that they do. And once you kind of understand what the Federal Reserve is up to, all political things don't really matter much anymore. You realize that it's all about the central banking monetary systems that are happening here. 
So once my eyes were opened up to the Federal Reserve, it was like the floodgates of information started flowing in and I just couldn't stop. And I just kept asking questions and going to Google and just kept building it up. And then uh, once I had started the YouTube channel, it made processing this information a lot easier. I realized that as I was watching CNBC or some of the other news articles out there, that a lot of people are confused by what's going on in the economy because of the way these people talk. Yep. They use a language that is so like unique to to like that particular industry that if you're not involved with it, it is very difficult to try and understand what it is that they're saying. But for the most part, it's like a code. And once I realized that these people are kind of speaking in this language, this code, and I could take it and decipher it into a language that anybody can understand, all of a sudden we started having conversations on this channel and like anybody else was doing. So that's really how the uneducated economists got started. I tell you what, it's, it's worth noting, John Bowens, that some of the nation's top economists tune in to hear Simon every time he talks. So he's he's not only built a, a following of like, I would say, folks like me, regular folks, but, you know, highly reputable economists are turning to him for his insights because the the wealth and the layers of knowledge he has, and that's going to kind of pigeonhole into my first question for him, is it's unmatched, I would say. So uh, kudos to what you're doing, Simon. Keep going because I'm definitely tuning in. Uh, but with that, can you bring me up to speed on what's going on with lumber here as we uh, start the fourth quarter? What what are you expecting? Sure. Um, just to kind of let your viewers know that I am I am deep in the lumber business. I do retail sales, <laughs> right? So anyway, I literally stand at a counter and I ring up two by fours for a living. But I'm also in the middle of the Pacific Northwest, and this is like tree farm country. So I know people who who are loggers, they cut trees, they haul trees. I know people who work at the mill. I know vendors, I know wholesalers, I know everybody within the entire like lumber distribution process. Like there is nobody that I don't have contact with. So when it came to the lumber, like run up to 1700 per thousand, there was a lot of misinformation that was taking place at the time. And there was very, there wasn't a whole lot of people who had, I, I would feel as much broad insight into the industry as I did. Um, and it's not like, you know, I'm trying to brag about it or anything. I just happen to be in a very unique position being where I'm located at. And then the position that I hold within my job. And then also the hobby of studying macroeconomics, this combination gave me a view unlike anybody else had. So when everybody was confused about the run up to 1700 per thousand, I was out on my channel, like screaming, don't fall for the inflation scenario on this thing. We are going to see lumber come back down in price. And that most of what you are seeing here is due to a supply chain breakdown. And it was really, I could, I mean, it was easy to see if you go back and look at my videos towards the end of 2019, there was like countless amounts of mill closures and mill curtailments and just inventory depletions taking place. And this was all prior to the 2020 pandemic taking place. So it was it was obvious to me that it was a supply chain breakdown and not so much the money printer go burr that was causing the and lumber prices to go up as high as they did. So being like the bullwhip effect that was really happening, which is where the industry is not quite clear on how much demand is really needed out there when you have like allocations and over orders and all kinds of stuff that are happening that just really obscure the market and the people who are providing the lumber to the industry they don't really know exactly how much is needed to be there so when you had this huge inventory depletion that took place during the pandemic right after the stimulus checks came out and everybody ran down to the lumber yard to build new decks and fences and remodel the house and do all that other stuff there was hardly any inventory in the market that's when the mills fired up and started pumping out a lot of lumber. Well, then the lumber prices crashed. It went from 1700 per thousand all the way down to 400 per thousand, only to jump back up to 800 per thousand again. Well, just recently, we're down at 400, 500 per thousand. Well, right now within the industry, now I'm trying to like, I mean, there's a lot that happened, so I just kind of blasted over most of that. But right now, what we have going on in the industry is that they have come to a point where there is more mill curtailments taking place right now due to the fact that we have the builder sentiment that is dropping. We have inventory levels that were quite high coming out of the last, uh, what was it, oversupply, undersupply situation that we had. 
So right now the market was filled with a lot of lumber. The mills were curtailing development going into the winter time where you would normally see prices drop. We're actually going to see prices going up due to the fact that we do have that inventory depletion taking place at this time. Uh, up in the British Columbia area is probably the most acute area that you should focus in on as far as like what's going to happen with lumber prices. Those mills up there in the British Columbia area are high cost, high output producers. And so the sense they are very sensitive to the market. And if the market starts to turn down where we get to this 400 or 500 per thousand, those mills up there really can't profit a lot at that lower price. And so they will just shut down and curtail development right away. And that's exactly what we saw happen. So uh, you, until I'm year, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Finish. I was saying, hey, until the new year, we are probably going to see prices continue to tick up from here. How far they go is going to be probably not very much, again, because of the builder sentiment being as low as it is right now. But right now, you'd say the lumber industry and the mills, it's healthy enough that they can control it. So whereas during the pandemic, they couldn't control because of the supply chain issues every and the demand was through the roof. So they had to fire up and try to make as much lumber as possible prices through the roof. But right now, no different than like OPEC can control the, you know, the oil output. Right now, their lumber is healthy enough. These mills are healthy enough to be able to turn it on, turn it off to where they can make money. Um, well, I mean, I think it's I think it's probably better to understand it. Not so much like, you know, like they can control it as much as to try and provide a steady flow of material to the market. Like, you know, it's really hard to see where the demand should be according to the inventory levels. Like, you got to think when they broke the supply chain, it's not like you can just make it happen again. Like, okay, we'll just fire up the mill and produce lumber and send it off to the store. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that. Like once the, su the supply chain had broken down, it's almost like trying to fill the sluices with water again. Right, to try and understand that because once the water had dissipated, once the lumber was gone out of the supply chain, now what you have to do is you have to fire up the mills again, but it's not just fire up the mills, you also have to cut the trees, right? And you also have to haul the trees down off the hills and get them to the mill, then from the mill, you gotta get them onto the rails, and then from the rails, you gotta get them down to the distribution hubs, and from the distribution hubs, you gotta get them onto the trucks and all the way to the retail. And if you have this whole thing broken down, you got to fill that whole thing in. You got to fill the log trucks. You got to fill the mills. You got to fill the distribution hubs, all the rail lines, all the everything going all the way down to the retail side. And you don't know exactly where that material needs to go. So, like, you know, it might be on trains headed down to the, you know, the southern part of the United States, while other parts of the United States are completely dry, of like, say, OSB sheathing lumber or something like that. So this is really where the problem exists is that you'll find some pockets of areas that will have plenty of lumber and like everybody's like, like, where's the missing lumber? Like, I don't understand the shortages that everybody keeps talking about. There's plenty of lumber here. Well, that's because they happen to be in that particular area where it's been, been distributed to. So until that whole thing is actually filled up and everybody is completely like filled with that inventory, you're going to continue to find these fluctuations happening. These mills, they don't know exactly where the inventory levels need to be. They're just going off of the pricing and the demand and, you know, what they're experiencing at the time. So there's going to be some years of this before we find that equilibrium. Do you have a question for Simon or I can I can queue up something here for him? Uh, go for it. All right, Simon. So and you mentioned this, the builder sentiment. So yeah. roughly about year over year, housing starts down about 15 percent in you know, call it September, August, compared to last year. How do you see this playing out? Builders are just stopping building right now, essentially, or contracts are canceling. How do you see this playing out? Because for our investors, you know, the whole build to rent craze was through the roof. You know, mm -hmm. I thought we're undersupplied on homes. We need homes, right? Inventory numbers are at all time lows. Right. We need building to be able to get these prices to be able to come down, which would bring more real estate investors into the game. I'm queuing you up. Where do you think about why are these builders stopping their starts? Um, it's the. Um, it's the fear It's it's the fear that there's going to be a downturn in the housing prices and they you know, you don't want to get stuck on a project that you had this anticipation that you were going to be able to sell it for, you know, a certain amount. But then by the time you complete the home, you have to sell it for less in order to, to actually move that move that product off your, you know, off your inventory and make the money off of it. 
So that's really, I think, where the major concern comes in. I, I have... I have a tendency to believe that we are going to see a downturn in the housing market as far as the prices go, but it's not going to be so significant that it's going to be a crash. And there's a couple of things that I look for in order to try and say, hey, we're going to see a crash, right? One of them is going to be foreclosures. If you see a lot of foreclosures taking place and you know that, you know, people aren't making their payments and they can't afford the the housing, you know, market in the condition that it is in. But we're not seeing a lot of rise in foreclosures. And what you would really need to see as far as a rise in foreclosures, there's a rise in unemployment. And right now, we still, even the conditions of the environment of the economy right now, we still have a fairly tight labor market. So I don't see unemployment rising that would cause that foreclosure issue to take place. So I'm not seeing the housing market crash like a lot of people are talking about. But I do see where you could have like a significant downturn in prices, especially like in hot areas. Like, I mean, the area that I'm in, I'm in like, you know, the Pacific Northwest, Portland area. I mean, prices of homes here, just like, they were stupid. They just, they went from like $400,000 to $500,000 even in the last year. And so if those houses, if you took sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 off of them, is that a crash or is that just kind of returning to normal? I mean, they shouldn't have gone up as high as they did. So, I mean, in my opinion, is it really a crash when you see a significant amount of money coming out of those houses when they have gone up as high as they have. So that's one of the one of the things that I think about as far as like where prices are going to end up going. Um, the other thing to think about is like, OK, so the mortgages, why are they, you know, the interest rates on them, are they going to continue to go up and how high can they really go? And is how much impact is that going to have onto the markets? Now, when I think about like the mortgage rates, you know, here we are like, what, 7 percent or something like that. That yeah. is incredible. I mean, that's like I mean, it's way up there. But and now I'm not sure because I haven't seen the newest stats or anything. But as of a couple of months ago, when I was reading about it, it looked like there was still a third of homes were going to all cash buyers. I don't know if that's still accurate or not. But even if it is remotely close to that, I mean, they don't really care where interest rates are and they're willing to buy at this price. So that's pretty interesting to think about all on its own is like how much demand there really is towards the prices for all cash buyers, because that's really where like how sticky are these prices going to be at that at that level? Well, I kind of look at that kind of kind of situation with the cash buyers on it. And then also like, you know, with the idea that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise interest rates into the future, a lot of people are concerned about like these mortgage rates continually to go up from here. And then I have to ask the question, well, you know, they started raising rates like quite a few months ago, like almost a year ago. Right. And it caused the mortgage rates to kind of jump up almost right away. And they jumped up to like that six or seven percent. Like, I mean, pretty much right away. And they kind of stalled out there. Like they've gone up a little bit more since the last rate hike, but not like significantly higher. I mean, it was just went from like six percent to seven percent, which is a lot. But it still wasn't like it went from. 3% 3% to the 6.5% like it did you know, when they first started raising rates. So that leads me to believe, okay, well, what's going on in the free market part of things? Because the Federal Reserve was participating inside of the mortgage market by buying up mortgage-backed securities. Now, if you're not familiar, I'm sure like your viewers are, but if there's a new listener, a mortgage-backed security is basically like a, as if you had taken a box and threw a bunch of mortgages in it. Right. And then sold that box off to an investor. So as everybody's paying their mortgage off, the investor gets, you know, their capital investment back plus the interest payments that you're making. Well, the Federal Reserve was buying up these mortgage backed securities at a like a huge clip, right? So they were pretty much like in the market driving the prices of these mortgage backed securities up and the yields on them down because yields work inversely to prices, much like, you know, a treasury bond would or something like that. So they created a lot of demand for these mortgage-backed securities, which the market just loved because they're like, well, hell, the Federal Reserve is buying these mortgage-backed securities, and that gives us all the reasons in the world to buy mortgage-backed securities as well. Since we definitely have a buyer of these things, we have no concerns over it as far as like not being able to find somebody to sell them to. So there was plenty of demand for these mortgage-backed securities during the quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve has done. Well, now they're stepping away from that. They're going to unload these mortgage-backed securities into the market, which has everybody concerned. And that's the reason why you're starting to see these mortgage rates rise is because these mortgage-backed security prices are going to fall and the yields are going to start to rise on them, which in turn is going to cause the mortgages that people pay 
to also go up as far as the interest rates payments that they make. Well, now I think about this for just a minute, and it was just like, okay, so if the Federal Reserve starts dumping these mortgage-backed securities into the market, causing the yields on them to rise, well, there is plenty of investors out there who are looking for fixed income investments. And right now, we have mortgage-backed securities that are not the toxic assets that they once were. I mean, there used to be a time when people would get these mortgages who simply should not have gotten them. They didn't have a job. They didn't have any kind of viable income. They had more than one property, whatever. They were a toxic investment and as far as those mortgage-backed securities go. Well, today, we don't have the mortgage-backed securities in that toxic environment like we once did. The, in, the people who have basically taken out mortgages were more viable lender or borrowers, right? They were scrutinized uh, more. So these mortgage-backed securities are a lot safer investment. And if that's the case, then I would imagine that as the fixed income investors are looking for a place to park that money, when you see the yields rise on these mortgage-backed securities, that gives them all the reason in the world to start buying into those mortgage-backed securities, adding support to the mortgage-backed security market and may not cause those yields to rise or the interest rates to rise as much as people are thinking they're going to when the Federal Reserve goes to continue to tighten up their monetary policies. That's a really, Did I say that? No, that's a, that's a really, really good point. And uh, it's, it's worth more research, which I'm definitely going to walk away from this conversation because the flooding the market with, with actual credible mortgage-backed securities that are going to give right. excellent yields are going to make those very, very attractive. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't gone down that road in my, uh, in my journey. But John, the theme of the day, since we've been sitting here so far, uh, Simon hit on uh, really twofold, two parts. Number one, the market's correcting, you know, and I think what you get a lot of YouTube clicks is collapse, the death of the housing market, and it's just this negative, negative, the world is ending sentiment. It's Armageddon for the housing market. But it's really, you know, I chuckled, Simon, when you mentioned that, hey, a $400,000 house in the North in Southwest Florida, where a $360,000 house in two years is nearly 700,000. So a five to 10% price reduction is not the end of the world for, uh, for the valuations, at least down here. And you start looking at Boise, Idaho, Austin, I'm um, in Southwest Florida and so forth. So uh, the appreciation level went way too high. So correction. The other point that he brought up, which I think is amazing, is the foreclosures. And right now, you know, we've been talking about this for a while, John. I don't think anybody is focused on the foreclosures because there just aren't any. But I think that's going to change over the next 18 months, which is why I want us to be hyper focused on that data month over month moving forward. You heard Simon said, right? as the Fed increases interest rates, just standard economics is they're going to do it until the unemployment rate goes up and they feel like they've got the room to be able to do it because it's three and a half percent. But if unemployment goes up, you got to think that there's going to be more foreclosures. They have to be directly related. Right. So awesome points, Simon. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you, James, yeah. that we have to also consider adjustable rate mortgages resetting. Right. And so we have to factor that into your foreclosure study. I think a key thing that I want to draw out here and then uh, send it back over to Simon to speak a little bit more to this is there are a lot of people that I talk to that are waiting for a complete crash. They're sitting on dry powder. They're waiting for a complete crash like we saw in the 2007 to 2009 Great Recession. And so they can start deploying their capital. And I, I think what we have to understand is there could be, of course, we don't know for certainty, there could be a complete crash, collapse. However, most of the signals point to a correction, just like we've been talking about here. Um, I understand that when the FOMC, when Jerome Powell makes a statement, uh, that's not absolutely going to be a prediction of what's going to happen. But I think it is important to note that in the last announcement, he mentioned that a correction is necessary to create balance in the housing markets. Yep. And I'm hearing Simon say the word correction as well. And there's a major difference between 
correction and collapse. Sure. And so I, what I'm interested to spend a little bit of time talking about and, and send this over to Simon to expand is for an investor that's looking to get involved in, let's say, single family residential property investing, which we talk a lot about. Now, certainly we could talk about how this is going to impact apartment building investing, investing in syndications for those that are investing in those types of partnerships. But just specifically for those that want to go out and buy and hold one to four family, single family residential, let's call it, um, what should these investors be considering in looking at what happened in the Great Recession compared to what we're seeing happening today and what we think could potentially happen let's say in Q2 to Q3 of 2023 and then into 2024, particularly for those investors that are sitting on a bunch of dry powder and are looking for, okay, where do I deploy this money? I can't continue to have my capital be eroded by inflation. Where should, what should I be doing and what should I be thinking about? Mm. Okay. Um, you know, the inflation scenario has been a very big concern for everybody. Now, one of the things that I had taken into consideration was a speech that I had read from um, New York Fed President John Williams, and it's called Monetary Policy for a Low Neutral Interest Rate World. Right? And in this speech, which was given, I think, in November of 2018, he said there was a part in there that he said that uh, part of the ways that there was three problems that the the economy was facing at the time. Um, it was a uh, low neutral, low interest rates on the uh, on the treasuries, right? Um, there was uh, global growth slowdown and a uh, demographics problem, right? So as the older populations, they don't spend as much money, they are drag on the economy, kind of thing. I mean, I'm just kind of briefly going over this. Global growth had slowed down dramatically. Um, and then this issue with the interest rates, I think that was probably the biggest one. And he talked about how this low uh, treasury yields were a problem and how the gap between the treasury yields and the corporate debt was uh, too significant at the time. And so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but ultimately they said that there was a fix to this and that they could have an inflation scenario. And this inflation scenario would end up being an average inflation rate. And now this is something that I found very interesting because in 2018, if you remember back then, they were trying to figure out where the hell they could even get inflation. Like they had raised the interest rates up to around 2% right after the whole the quantitative easing and everything. And it pissed the markets off right away. And they had to almost immediately reverse course. Right. And so they were stuck on this idea of like, how the hell are we going to raise these interest rates up when every time we go to raise them, we start destroying the markets. So I, I was questioning at the time, I'm like, how in the world are they going to get these interest rates to go up? How are they going to get this inflation scenario? And now in this speech, he mentions that they were going to go and have this idea of an average inflation rate. Now, try and stick with me on this, because this is really where I think everybody is kind of missing it, is that in this average inflation, it's not a 2% target. It's a 2% target over time. And so where everybody is kind of concerned that the Federal Reserve is going to pivot and stuff, what they are looking at is this 2% target inflation that the Federal Reserve used to actually target. Like if the inflation rate was above 2%, they would adjust monetary policy to try and bring that inflation back down to the 2%. If it was running under, again, they would adjust it to try and bring the inflation back up to that 2% target. And they would constantly aim for a 2%. Well, now it's a 2% average inflation over time which means that at some times they're going to have interest rates low when they shouldn't or when it shouldn't appear that they should have them low. And then again, they'll have them high when it doesn't appear that they should have them there because what they're doing is they're going for a 2% average inflation over time. So what this has done is that when they kept the interest rates artificially low for a significant amount of time, causing the asset prices to go up dramatically, like we saw with the housing prices, what they were attempting to do is try and inflate those asset prices up significantly so that when they do drop these or when they do raise the interest rates to try and bring the inflation down, they can bring those asset prices back down to what they should have been prior to the, uh, artificially restricting the interest rates down. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that does so, make sense. 
long term. So when everybody is kind of looking at the Federal Reserve saying, OK, well, they're going to go for this two percent target. They're not. Don't don't think that they are. They're going for a two percent average inflation over time. And I just recently did a video on it. You can see it in their documents. They straight up said it. They made announcements on it on the news. And now nobody talks about average inflation, but everybody talks about a 2% target. But that's not what they're going for. It's a misconception that a lot of people are having. And they're making decisions on this idea that the Federal Reserve is shooting for this 2% target when they're not. They're going for that average inflation over time. So we are going to see these these interest rates stay elevated for a significant amount of time, even farther beyond than what people are anticipating. Even after the inflation comes down, the interest rates are still going to stay high because they got to get that average inflation rate. That's a really good point. And Simon, I really appreciate you bringing that to light because we have to mm -hmm. think as investors. I, I always think of it from this perspective. I have my self-directed IRAs and 401ks. I have my retirement savings accounts. And then I have my non-retirement savings capital. And I heard someone describe this as, uh, it, it was actually uh, Kevin O'Leary. And he talks about how he sends his soldiers out to, out to war, right? And those soldiers have to, have to bring back uh, safely. They have to bring back uh, people and they have to bring back themselves and equipment and everything else. And that's the way I, I look at deploying my capital is I have to preserve my wealth I can't lose my principal, and inflation is going to impact my principal. Sure. And so as I'm sending my, my capital out to work for me, I have to work extra hard, right? Right now, in a high inflationary environment, I have to work extra hard to preserve my principal and, most importantly, make, make a return, make a healthy return in safe investments. And so that's as an investor, that's what I'm looking for. And on this show, Building Equity, that's what we're trying to do is help investors understand how they could potentially deploy their capital into investments that are going to be able to target a higher yield than, of course, inflation, what the inflation rate is at, and a higher yield than maybe what they could make in other forms of investments, such as investing in the fixed income markets or in the publicly traded stock market. Uh, so I, I think that's a, a great point that, that Simon mentioned. I, I wanted to make sure I, I put um, some more meat behind that in terms of from an investor and, and what I'm looking at and what I'm considering. Um, that being said, because we don't give investment advice or recommendations on this show, I, I'll also say that there are times that even though I know my dry powder has this erosion effect, because of inflation, yep. I have to be timing up what's happening in, in the markets so that I can find that right entry point. And I think that's what the key is, is finding the right entry point, whether you're looking to invest in, in the stock market or you're looking to invest in, in the real estate market. So I'm, I'm going to pause there. I wanted to make that comment. But anything, um, Simon, based on, on what I just kind of brought to the discussion plate here, uh, for our viewers to, to consider beyond what you've already said. Um, um, well, I mean, not to push back against like, you know, the dollar eroding inflation, but right now we got a stronger dollar happening. And if you look at it towards the basket of world currencies, the U.S. dollar index is the highest it's been in 20 years. This is not something that a lot of people are anticipating, especially after all the inflation narrative that was screamed out through the mass media attention that was brought to the money printer go burr kind of thing. Now, I have said it a long time ago that I'm not going to fall for this inflation scenario. I do not believe it is the same that a lot of people are talking. There, I don't think the money printer go burr had as much impact on the prices as the supply chain breakdown did. Now, granted, I, it is impossible to have an inflation price inflation like we experienced without the money printing happening. So the Federal Reserve definitely had an impact on inflation. But the overall impact from it, I don't think was quite the same as what everybody else seems to think. Um, you know, if you look back at the quantitative easing one, two, three, and four, it failed to produce the 2% inflation target that the Federal Reserve was looking for. And I mean, talk about money printer. They went from $850 billion on their balance sheet to $4.3 trillion on a percentage basis. It was far more money printing than it happened over the last, you know, couple of years. 
I mean, granted, you know, the the amount of money that they actually produced over the last few years was significantly more. But again, from a percentage basis, 850, 850 billion to 4.3 trillion was far more. And it didn't produce the 2% inflation that they were looking for. So that's something that a lot of people do not seem to want to answer for me when I ask them about how come the money printer didn't make the inflation that they were expecting. Now, it did find its way into assets and stocks, but not necessarily into the everyday items that we buy like it did this time. This time around, we had a significant supply chain breakdown. I mean, there was 100 freighters, over 100 freighters parked off of the port of L.A. That was full of stuff that should have been sitting on the shelves. If it was sitting on the shelves, then people wouldn't have been freaking out about there not being anything to buy. And the inflation scenario thing probably wouldn't have existed. It was very fabricated with this, with a shooting in the foot of, of the supply chain. I mean, they did it on purpose. So I... I don't look at the inflation, the price inflation, quite the same as everybody else does. Now, you're right. There is an erosion of money over time. Like holding on to cash is not smart for 20 years. That doesn't that doesn't make any sense, right? Because you are going to lose your purchasing power over that time. But when you when when you see as much demand for the dollar out there, when there is countries who are writing their debts in U.S. dollars, I mean, think about this. We got Sri Lanka. We got corporations in China like Evergrande. These are corporations and countries that have written debts in dollars. They're due in dollars. And so when they come due, there is a demand for dollars that exists outside of this country. It doesn't have anything to do with our government, doesn't have anything to do with our banking system, doesn't have anything to do with anything of us. But yet it creates this demand for dollars out there because we hold this world reserve currency. Now, what's even scarier about this whole thing is that those contracts get used as if they're dollars. Right. So not only are they due in dollars, but then they get used as dollars. Right. They're not even dollars. They're just getting used as it. So if you can imagine that the demand for dollars that exist out there when you've got contracts being used as dollars and not actually being dollars, but yet the demand for it exists for it. Imagine all these contracts start to come due, which is starting to happen right now. The demand for dollars could explode to a level unlike anybody had ever seen. You could see the dollar more valuable than anybody's ever could imagine in their lifetime. And it's going to be very short-lived as those contracts begin to come due. And at the end of it, you may find where the dollar has completely lost its all its value and nobody is using it as a world reserve currency and the United States finds itself in poverty. Now, that could be a very likely scenario. How long that takes, I don't know. But right now, just look around the world. There is a huge demand for dollars. And it's not so much like you have to look at prices because prices are the results of inflation. I mean, inflation is the expansion of money and credit. Deflation is exactly the opposite, the destruction of money and credit. But right now, the Federal Reserve is pulling their money back in, right? They're allowing treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to roll out their balance sheet. That When that happens, those are dollars coming back to the Federal Reserve getting destroyed. Right. That is that is tightening up the monetary policy that is less dollars out there. And this is going to be this is promised to us for the next couple of years, at least. So I I see going into the future a tighter monetary policy. I see inflation coming down significantly and I see a lot of pain to the people. Now, when that happens, cash is the position you want to be in. Right. Because you buy when there's blood in the streets and the Federal Reserve has promised pain. So what do we expect? Pain. Right? I, I couldn't agree with Simon more. Now, as we can see the sun coming up in the Northwest, Simon, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the Building Equity Podcast. And for all our viewers, go to YouTube. You're clearly watching us on YouTube. Do the search, The Uneducated Economist. Click subscribe on his channel. Uh, this was just a taste of some of the information that Simon has. And again, I walk away with it. It's what I appreciate, Simon, is you force, I'm going to say you force somebody like me to walk away with actionable steps that say, okay, I need to look a little bit deeper into this. I get you're connecting two of the dots that I've never been able to kind of uh, see before, but now I could do my research and go a little bit further. And it's the way that you kind of translate it into regular speak is what I'll call. And I know a lot of our viewers are regular folks that are doing real estate investing. And you heard it from Simon. I think the next 18 to 24 months, there's gonna be a huge change and there's going to be major opportunity for real estate investors in the United States. So, Simon, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to get you back here again and uh, have a wonderful day.
Yeah, you bet, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Excellent. We'll see you soon, okay? All right, man. Thank you very much. All right, bye. John Bowens, we just had a chance to listen to Simon, the uneducated economist, a man who knows how to translate <laughs> the economy in complex terms so everybody can understand it. And as I mentioned to him, I literally have like three or four nuggets that I'm gonna go try to research further. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that we had a chance to talk about him. Were you happy with him? Absolutely, I, I think something he left, at, at the very end he started to talk about deflation. Yep. And so there's, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of conversation around inflation. The two points with respect to the US dollar, I think that's something that as investors we need to continue to consider. In fact, I was just speaking to another investor uh, from New York and he was, he was at a, a, a social gathering and he met a few folks that were from overseas and they're trying to deploy their capital into real estate in the United States. Uh, and so you have to consider what's happening with the United States dollar and you have to consider what could potentially happen with respect to deflation. I tell you, it's, he hit the point and he mentioned nobody saw the strength of the dollar uh, increasing. That came out of left field and it completely caught me uh, by surprise. Uh, my investment portfolio, I just had this narrative of, oh my goodness, the Fed is printing so much money it's gonna devalue the dollar, so start hedging the dollar. And yet here, as soon as interest rates started increasing, the strength of the dollar went through the roof. And it kind of makes me think, you know, we're, we're in very unique times right now because over the last 30 years, if you were to look at like a graph of interest rates, the interest rates have slowly been declining over the last 30 years. We've, from an investor standpoint, we've, been in this world where everything is decreasing and going to all times low and then kept low. So now how does one invest as everything is increasing and it kind of changes the game, which is why I had no experience in it and I didn't expect the strength of the dollar. So just all fun stuff for us to be able to learn, but I keep going back to this one point for real estate investors. You don't really have to know all the stuff that's going on at the macro level and what's going on in bonds and commodities and all this stuff. Get a tenant, Get a good tenant, and chances are they're going to pay you the next month, and that's a really good investment strategy. And you don't have to worry about all the crazy nonsense. Just find a great property. The beauty, uh, one of the things that will, one of the guests we'll have on the show, Jason Hartman, on this upcoming season, he talks about all the time is that a real estate transaction or the real estate, the financials, the calculations of a real estate deal can constantly change over time. So even though you purchased it in 2023. Well, you can increase the rent and that changes the financials and your ROI of that deal. You have so much more control over a real estate investment than you would when you buy a stock at a hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just endless opportunity. It's a great time to be a real estate investor and I'm excited about this season. I just like looking in your eyes.